Thank you, uh, Destry, and uh, good morning, everyone from California. It's uh, still morning here. A uh, beautiful day in uh, Payomkawachum territory, which is where I work, that is uh, the Luiseno territory. And the Paula Band of Mission Indians is Payomkawachum and Kupangawachum people. And their reservation was created here in 1875, but they have inhabited these lands from time immemorial. I myself am not indigenous, but I have worked for Paula on the staff for 17 years, started the Tribal Historic Preservation Office, and have been their TIPO, as we say for short, um, ever since. And I'm going to share my screen because I have a, a presentation that I'm sharing with you today. And what I wanted to talk to you all about today was how climate change has intangible effects on tribal identity, tribal values, uh, and tribal traditions. It's not just about what happens physically, it's also about the cultural impacts. So I want to start with climate change itself and the concept of climate change, because for a lot of people, when they hear climate change, there are certain things that come to their mind. People think of melting ice when they hear climate change. They think of rising sea levels, and this is the Alaska traditional village of Newtok, which is experiencing rapid sea level rise. They also think of extreme weather events. We have all sorts of extreme weather that's happening, not just in the United States, but around the world. Tornadoes, bomb cyclones, blizzards, or on the opposite spectrum, um, we have drought. That's another thing that we think of, especially in the Southwest, when we think of climate change, is lack of access to water, less rainfall, less snowfall, all part of climate change. Another physical thing that we experience and that people, again, that they think of when they think about the effects of climate change is heat. And even though it's almost the last day of October, it is in the mid 80s here in Southern California. So extreme heat is becoming a regular part of our daily lives. And then finally, not just in California, but all over the West and in many parts of the world, I think of Australia in particular, we have wildfire. And all of these things are the environmental effects that people think of when they hear climate change, when they talk about climate change, when they think about the ways that they are planning to adapt to the effects of climate change or mitigate the effects of climate change. These effects are definitely things that we all need to think about, but when it comes to tribal communities, indigenous communities, there are different things that we have to consider. One of those things is the effects of climate change on what's called tribal cultural resources. And I put that in quotation marks because it's a very sort of government or academic way to talk about something that is actually much more difficult to define. Uh, a tribal cultural resource in most people's minds when they think of things that need protection are things like I have pictured here. So for example, a village site, an archeological site, um, you know, monumental architecture, or rock art is another example. And then artifacts like pottery, these are pot sherds in the upper right corner and projectile points or worked stone, and this would be a spear point. Um, people who don't know, we usually will call them arrowheads, but they're not all arrowheads. Every, every arrowhead is a projectile point, but not every projectile point is an arrowhead. So these are tribal cultural resources, and they are impacted by climate change. But a lot of tribal cultural values and traditions are impacted in ways that most people don't really think about. But the tangible effects of the standard climate change issues that come to people's minds, like melting ice, melting ice is certainly contributing to sea level rise, but it's also contributing from a traditional standpoint to things like the loss of traditional hunting areas. In the indigenous communities of Alaska and the Arctic, melting ice means that you can't always get to those places where you might have fished or where you might have hunted for sea mammals like walrus, like seals. And so if that ice isn't there, that has an effect on your culture and your values and your traditions. So it's not just about the environment, it's also about the traditions. The same is true of sea level rise. 
in the case of the village pictured here in New Talk, they're talking about relocation of the village and relocating that village. It's not just a matter of taking those houses and moving them higher up, you know, on higher ground or away from the coastline. It's also about the connection that people have to that land. But the physical effect is village relocation. Another tangible effect of extreme weather might be canceled ceremonies. So there are certain ceremonies that take place during very specific times of year, things like the days that mark the changing of the seasons. So if you have a ceremony that relies on, or for the first day of winter, and that ceremony relies on the presence of snow, and perhaps the extreme weather that you're experiencing is a lack of snow during a time when you would normally expect to have snowfall. And that means that you might not be able to do the ceremony in the way that it's meant to be done. You have to cancel that ceremony. Uh, it might also be true that extreme weather that causes flooding might make an area inaccessible that's important for a particular ritual or uh, traditional practice. Drought. Drought has impacts on many things, but one thing it impacts for indigenous people is traditional farming. So the Hopi, for example, have learned how to grow corn using dry farming techniques, and they access water that's deep in the ground by planting that corn kernel 12 inches below the surface where there is under, you know, underground water, there's moisture down below, and so they're able to sprout that corn without irrigation. But now drought is making it so that 12 inches isn't deep enough, and even 24 inches may not be sufficient. Um, it, it might just be too deep, even if the moisture is there for that cr uh, corn to, to make it to the surface. So there are impacts on things like traditional farming from climate related drought. Heat is the same way it affects traditional species. It may be that a certain plant may not be able to grow because there's too much heat. I learned from friends and colleagues in Alaska recently, I was there in August doing a climate change training that heat is happening after the berries are sprouting and berries are very important as a traditional harvest and subsistence food. And so the berries are starting to sprout and then a heat wave comes and the fruit rots on the vine. So a heat has an effect on traditional practices. And then finally, wildfire. Wildfire can certainly have an effect on archeological sites, but generally it's not so severe that the site itself is utterly destroyed, especially if you're talking about things that are are stone or um, made of adobe, that kind of thing. But there are gathering areas that are destroyed. There are traditional places that are destroyed. So these are some of the tangible effects on indigenous communities. But what about the intangible effects? And I, am, I uh, referred to a couple of those already. One intangible effect is on identity. So we talked about relocation of villages in Alaska. And that's not just occurring in Alaska, it's happening in many places. But the question becomes, who am I if I have to leave my ancestral lands? What does, what does it mean if I am unable to access the places that I am accustomed to accessing? If they are underwater, if they have been destroyed, that is an intangible effect on values and traditions. And speaking of values, there are questions of how do you reinforce your values if your ceremonies can't go on? If your winter tradition is to be able to wash yourself with the snow on the first snowfall and the first snowfall never happens, then you have an inability to reinforce those intangible values, those things that are linked to the environment but are actually part of culture and tradition. Uh, and I'm going to pause here and ask Douglas if he would please mute himself because we can hear a little bit of background noise. And then finally, traditions. What happens if you can't continue your traditions, if you can't hunt, gather, fish, and harvest? What does that mean for cultural values? What does that mean for your feelings about your identity as an Indigenous person? And I have had, again, friends and colleagues say things to me like, we didn't get wild rice this year, or we weren't able to fish for salmon this year. For the first time ever, we had to buy salmon from Alaska, even though we're a California tribe, and we couldn't use our own salmon for our ceremonies and traditions. What does that say about me as, for example, a Yurok person or as an Anishinaabe person? If you cannot hunt and gather 
fish and harvest your traditional foods. Those are intangible things that are being dramatically affected by climate change. So a few takeaways here. It's important to acknowledge that climate change threatens cultures, identities, and values, as I've talked about, and it threatens traditions just as much as it threatens the environment. We also need to recognize that tribal cultural heritage is not just about the things we can touch. It goes beyond the tangible to values that are intangible. And that means that safeguarding tribal cultural heritage means an acknowledgement of those intangible effects of climate change. That's something that we as professionals in heritage resource management, in historic preservation, we have to think about the intangible as well as the tangible effects when we do our work. So what do we do? It's a heavy lift. One thing I would recommend, and I say this uh, not only as Paula's tribal historic preservation officer, but also as the chair of the board for NAFPO, the National Association of Tribal Historic Preservation Officers, is that as much as possible, you work directly with indigenous communities and follow their lead. One thing that I have experienced in my role uh, at NAFPO and at Paula is that we have to do a lot of education on cultural management, resource management professionals. They don't understand tribal values, especially oftentimes early in their careers, but we also find people who have been doing this work for a long time and have just never had the opportunity to work directly with indigenous people and learn about what their values are and what they find most important to protect. It might not be what you expect, and they may have ideas that may not have occurred to you. The next thing you can do is actively support indigenous land stewardship. There was an article recently in the Atlantic magazine where the author who was indigenous suggested that national parks should be co-managed with the tribes. Turn the national parks back over to the tribes whose ancestral lands are included within the boundaries of those parks. And even though I say ancestral lands, I want to point out ancestral makes it sound like, yeah, it was theirs a long time ago. But the reality is, is that these are still tribal lands. These are still native lands, even if they are not part of the reservation, all the land in the United States is indigenous land. And so supporting indigenous land stewardship so that tribes themselves can have the responsibility for managing and maintaining their own cultural heritage is really important. And related to that, return heritage areas to the tribes. Now, the tribes will talk about this in terms of what's called land back. You'll sometimes see that hashtag land back. This is something that I think needs to be very strongly considered by governments, by private entities that might hold heritage areas under their stewardship. Return those places to the tribes who are willing and able and, and have that desire to run those areas. And there are some great examples of co-management um, in California. Uh, the, the Yurok tribe, which I mentioned previously, is in Northern California, and they worked with California state parks to become the managers of one of the state parks that is part of their traditional landscape. And not every tribe is necessarily going to want this responsibility, but when you think about an enormous heritage area like the Grand Canyon, which is sacred to multiple tribes in the Southwest, why not return those lands to those who have been stewarding them since time immemorial? I think it's well past time to be considering land back as, a, as an important potential strategy for protecting indigenous cultural heritage. And that's where I'm going to pause. And thank you very much for your attention and participation today. I am very much looking forward to being able to speak with you about these issues after we hear from our other distinguished panelists. And Destry, I turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shasta. That was excellent. Um, I would um, remind everybody that we're gonna hold questions until the three panel members have spoken, um, but don't hesitate to go ahead and start putting questions in the Q&A or use the chat if that's easier. Um, I'll be going through them and passing them on to the speakers when we get to that point. Um, our next speaker is Karen Atkinson, wh whom I must say is a, a friend of mine. We both served 
in the Clinton administration uh, with the National Park Service Department of the Interior. Um, Karen was the senior counsel to the assistant secretary, Fish, Wildlife and Parks, um, carrying out um, policy and uh, oversight with both the Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, later in her term, uh, she was <laughs> and did a fabulous job in that capacity. Um, even before that, um, she was senior counsel to the uh, U.S. Senate's in Indian Affairs Committee. Um, and I should note that she is a Stanford graduate and um, got her law degree from the University of New Mexico Law School. Uh, one of the things that I was most um, excited to be working along with Karen, who had the lead responsibility on, uh, was a, a land transfer that we engineered with Karen's leadership um, of land within Death Valley National Park to the Timbasha Shoshone people, um, where they had lived uh, from time immemorial as, as Shasta come to. Um, Karen, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, please go ahead with your program, and we'll come back um, uh, at the end. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, Destry, for such a lovely introduction. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here today. Um, as Destry said, I have um, a long history uh, of working in public land management um, as a tribal advocate on um, federal Indian law and cultural resource preservation and spent um, about 20 years in Washington, D.C. Um, in various capacities. And before that, I had worked as in-house counsel for a tribe in um, Northwest Montana where I worked on treaty rights issues and hunting and fishing issues. Um, but also sacred site protection um, for tribal resources um, of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. And I am now happily retired. I've, I've left Washington and am now in the um, Southwest and very happy to be here um, just to have an opportunity to talk about some issues that are very close to my heart. And I do have a presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and share that with you now. So this is also what happens once you've retired. You're not as proficient in the technology. Um, but anyway, what I, I think um, I'm very happy to hear Shasta's presentation and her perspective on the role of indigenous people in climate actions. And I think her presentation is a very good segue in what I'd like to talk about. And um, that is what scientists are learning from indigenous people and the use of traditional ecological knowledge in climate change actions and climate change research. I cover, I'll, my presentation will cover a couple of themes, I think, or emphasize a couple of themes and a number of points that Shasta emphasized in her presentation. And I think uh, one of the key points is that indigenous people do have a critical role in developing climate change strategies. And that arises based on their relationship with their, their ancestral lands. And indigenous people have historic, legal, and cultural ties to large geographic areas. And in the United States, indigenous communities ceded vast territories of land to the federal government and in return received a promise that their tribal way of life would be protected and tribal rights would be protected. And in some instances, tribes um, in ceding those lands retain the right to hunt, fish, and gather on those lands. And today, many of those lands lie within federal public lands and state public lands. And the relationships that tribes have with those, land, those lands, they've continued those relationships 
even though they no longer have ownership of those lands. And they've had to build working relationships with the current managers of those lands. And tribal identities and cultural foundations for many indigenous communities are closely linked to those ancestral lands and to the subsistence activities and cultural traditions that have been passed down from generations and that are still continued today. And for most indigenous communities, in order to continue those traditions and subsistence activities, they've had to have stewardship over those lands and a knowledge of those lands in order to continue those important um, either hunting or fishing activities or gathering activities on lands that are now in the public domain. And as a result of that, they've developed unique experience as resource managers. And the effects of climate change really has threatened not only natural elements of the ecosystem, but also has resulted in the loss of traditional foods, in impacting important cultural traditions, maybe that can't take place either at the time of year that it used to happen or in the location that it used to happen and has resulted in restricted access to important sites and activities. And land managers and scientists really can gain a lot by understanding the relationship of indigenous communities and the ecosystem and the knowledge that indigenous communities can bring to these studies really can help broaden an understanding of climate data. And I think one of the key points is that indigenous people can bring an understanding of the role that people play in the ecosystem. So it's not just looking at the impacts to the natural, natural system or to a landscape, but how indigenous communities have interacted with that landscape. And because indigenous communities still carry out subsistence activities and traditional cultural activities within their ancestral lands, they really have a deep knowledge of those places. And they have an understanding of the natural systems, of the natural cycle of plants and animals and weather patterns because their continued subsistence activities or traditional gathering activities or cultural ceremonies that still occur are dependent on, um, on those things. And I'd like to give an example of where traditional ecological knowledge was incorporated into a climate study. And this study um, was a partnership between the Smith River and Elk Valley Rancherias and the California Department of Parks and it was um, focused on the Tolowa Dune State Park. And the Tolowa Dune State Park is located on the coast of Northern California. And the park is within the ancestral territory of the Tolowa people. And there are important cultural sites um, located within the park. Uh, the, uh, the, there are sites that are important to the creation stories of the Tolua people and sites that are important to um, historic traditional fishing villages. And these sites, um, because these sites, uh, or these sites were listed on the National Register of, um, as a historic district on the National Register because of the cultural and historic values associated with those sites and the Tolua people. And the park is also important from an environmental point of view because the park contains one of the last remaining sand dune forest systems within the state of California. And in this partnership, the purpose of the partnership was to investigate the potential effects that rises in sea level and storm surges would have on Tolua cultural resources and their traditional fishing camps within the park. 
and the investigators incorporated traditional indigenous knowledge. And um, in, the investigators interviewed Tolwa elders and to learn about past severe weather events, to learn about tsunamis that had happened. And as a result of the oral history information that was gathered, the investigators learned personal insights and family stories about severe storms and how the Tolua people survived those storms in the past and how they were able to protect their traditional fishing activities and fishing villages. The traditional ecological knowledge that was gained really was integrated or provided personal observations of climate data. So climate data and geologic data was also gathered, but by incorporating traditional ecological knowledge, the investigators and researchers had broadened the information that was available about the effects of that climate on these particular cultural resources and traditional fishing activities located within the park. And the researchers used GIS mapping to integrate the ethnographic, geologic, and oral history accounts of climate in these culturally important areas. In the final report, they found that there's likely to be significant severe weather events that will cause further erosion and um, loss of archaeological sites and cultural resources located along the coast within the park. And as a result of the collaboration, the Elk Valley Rancheria developed a management plan to address some of the potential um, effects that climate change would have on cultural resources within the park. And that management plan will be adopted by the park. So it was a very unique collaboration in which traditional ecological knowledge was used along with climate data to get a fuller understanding that climate data had or that climate had within the park and that climate had on these traditional subsistence activities, the traditional harvesting of fish um, along the coast in Northern California and on the cultural resources um, that still remain in the park. The example shows that there's a critical role that indigenous people can play in assessing vulnerability to climate change and developing strategies to promote resilience. Traditional ecological knowledge can serve as the basis for assessing climate change through regional specific observation, knowledge, and interpretation, as was done in the Tolwa Park based on the oral history information gathered from the Tolwa elders. They were able to expand an understanding of the climate data that was collected. And the, the tribe was actually had a critical role in developing adaptive plans, plans to address potential impacts to those cultural resources due to the effect of climate change. And I think it's important when thinking about including indigenous people in assessing the vulnerability to climate change, but in developing strategies to promote resilience. I think the one thing that's really important to understand is to look not only at the effects that climate change will have on a natural system, but also recognize that it also can impact the subsistence and cultural activities that are associated with those resources and that indigenous communities still have historic ties to and still have retained rights to continue to use those resources as they have done for generations. And using, I know there's been a lot of discussion about using traditional ecological knowledge in the context of climate change. And the one thing that I just would like to remind people is that the use of traditional ecological knowledge is not new, that land managers and researchers 
have relied on traditional knowledge for decades. And it's been used in the management of cultural resources. It's been used on the management of natural resources. And there are already in place recommendations and a number of tools for how to engage with indigenous communities. And those tools can be used in the context of addressing climate change and developing strategies to address climate change. The, um, for instance, there are government to government protocols already in place that can govern and provide guidance to engagement with tribal communities. And because traditional ecological knowledge is based, often based on the spiritual traditions of the tribe and cultural traditions of the tribe, there will be a sensitivity for sharing that knowledge. And so it, it'll likely be necessary to address ways in which traditional eco ecological knowledge, how it will be used in a study and um, who will own the rights to the data, who will own rights to the knowledge once it is gathered and then how that will be protected in any final report. And again, um, you can use memorandum of agreements or written protocols to address how those issues related to the use of tra traditional ecological knowledge. And there are models for that. I mean, there are already good models for um, those types of, of protocols. And because of their continued relationship with their ancestral lands and because many important tribal rights like the right to hunt and fish and gather and still have access to those natural resources that enable those subsistence activities and those cultural activities, many indigenous communities are really have a vested interest to be involved in these type of uh, research studies and management plans that are developed. And many communities have developed climate strategies, climate action plans for their own tribal lands. And there are already a number of collaborations that are going on where uh, indigenous communities and Indian tribes are working with land managers to address the effects of climate in particular on subsistence activities up in the Northwest, up in the Great Lakes. And indigenous people have a vested interest in continuing those activities. And I think they'll bring a lot to the table because their continued reliance is really dependent on their continued use of those areas. And I think as was shown in the Tolowa Parks collaboration, that these type of partnerships really can bring the opportunity for not only input into these research efforts and development of management plans, but also for indigenous management of those resources and co-management of those resources. And I think that really concludes my presentation and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. That was excellent. I loved your Tolawa Dunes example. Um, I visited there a number of times when I was working for the Yurok tribe. Oh, wonderful. They've gotten ahead of Yurok in their co-management cooperative activities with federal agencies. Um, as Shasta mentioned, they the Yurok have done well with the state parks uh, in the Redwood area, just south of Tolawa. Um, but, uh, but that's a great example, and we look forward to more of those uh, success stories in, in the future. So um, I think now we'll, we can um, uh, switch now to Rob Markham, um, and then the panel will come back together uh, after Rob's presentation for some joint discussion and Q&A. Um, Rob is, he has the unique title of being indigenous knowledge broker uh, in uh, Kakadu National Park in Australia, where he has been a park ranger for 15 years, um, using 
indigenous knowledge to regular conservation management uh, in that national park. And he previously graduated with honors from the University of Queensland. And his thesis topic was the consideration of indigenous knowledge. Um, he's, he's currently working on a master's project with his thesis topic, Indigenous Knowledge in Environmental Sciences. Uh, Rob, take it over. Uh, good morning or um, good afternoon, uh, depending on uh, what part of the world you're um, viewing in today. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'm very uh, happy to be here today and uh, hear all the uh, interesting uh, presentations and looking forward to the um, a, uh, uh, an ongoing uh, a dialogue with this uh, very important topic. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, uh, Robert Markham. I am a Bolomo clansman from the Jawa Nation, uh, situated in uh, Kakadu National Park, Northern Territory, Australia. So yeah, Kakadu National Park is where I'm from and where my tribal lands are from. Um, it's a World Heritage um, listed national park where I have over 15 years um, experience as an Indigenous ranger, incorporating Indigenous knowledge in conservation management. Um, currently, uh, as uh, mentioned in my introduction, the Indigenous Knowledge Broker for the State of Environment, where every five years we produce a report for the Federal Environmental Minister of um, exactly that, the state of the environment. Uh, this in turn informs policies, procedures, and brings to light the important aspects of how environmental management is going. It is uh, a very exciting time for us and for Indigenous people throughout Australia, because it is the um, first time that we're incorporating Indigenous knowledge in the, um, in the report by Indigenous authors. Um, so I'd like to present uh, today a very brief overview of how we, the Jarwin, and traditionally Aboriginal people in Australia are connected to the environment through kinship and through this kinship system use Indigenous knowledge to manage the environment. A kinship uh, kinship in, is a central element in Aboriginal society. And the kinship system is divided into two moieties and then 16 uh, subclassifications, eight into each moiety. Uh, we call these uh, subclassification skin groups. And these two moieties and skin groups give a person position in the world and establishes their relationships to all that exists. The kinship structure provides and governs responsibilities between people, animals, plants, and the land. Kinship provides connection to Pacific environments and access to ceremonies. Kinship connects us to the land and gives us identity. A collective of people, animal, animals and land all bound by kinship. Throughout Australia, the kinship structure goes by different names used by, by many different language groups. Yet the kinship principles and functions are the same. This allows Aboriginal people to travel and trade with neighbouring language groups using kinship to inform correct social, political and eco-friendly ways to behave. Kinship structures remain important to traditional owners throughout Australia, using it to maintain a deep spiritual, emotional and physical connection to the environment. Through kinship connections to the environment, traditional owners have layered relational knowledge with everything in the world. This layered relational knowledge is generally termed as Indigenous knowledge. And as relational knowledge can be different between nations due to different environments, so too is the Indigenous knowledge variance specific to, re to related country. This relational knowledge and intimate connection to everything in the environment is important to ma maintain healthy ecosystems. By maintaining a, the physical presence within the environment through kinship, Aboriginal communities attempt to ensure ongoing relational knowledge systems exist where we can monitor climate change and respond with Indigenous knowledge conservation application. This is crucial to maintain a connection to the environment in our contemporary world as we endeavour to navigate ourselves through climate change. This is not the first time 
we as people of the earth have been confronted with climate change. This is documented in our song lines, indexing to oral and visual accounts of past climate change events. It is, however, the first time the impacts of climate change are significantly increasing with projected long-term and ongoing effects due to the contemporary human condition, or if you like, simply our footprint. As we move into an era where climate change is dramatically increasing, Aboriginal communities throughout Australia are on the front line as they experience the effects directly and attempt to deal with climate change. One way traditional owners are dealing with climate change in Australia is by a fire application. So as, I, as mentioned in my introduction, I'm currently, currently enrolled in a master's research program in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Queensland. My research case study for my master's thesis is fire management in Kakadu. My thesis title is Indigenous Knowledge in Environmental Science. I chose fire management as a case study in connection with the Threatened Species Program running in Kakadu National Park, where Indigenous knowledge is the crucial indicator in addressing multiple issues affecting the bio biodiversity of flora and fauna. Fire management in the Endangered Species pr Program in Kakadu National Park is very significant because of the variety of impact areas it covers in addressing the concerning events of a dramatically changing environment and the pressures these events place on biodiversity. Fire management is crucial and a key role or a key tool to managing sustainable environments and particularly in Australia where fire regimes have sculpted our diverse ecosystems. It is important to understand that this is continual as today's fire regimes continue to sculpture, manipulate and have big influences on ecosystems. Fire application and management need to be dynamic to suit a changing environment where climate change and outdated conservation management regimes can cause significant and in many cases irreversible impacts to the ecosystem. My master's research came about by discussions with Indigenous field rangers and the traditional owners of the South Alligator floodplains in Kakadu National Park. Late season fires, applications in a changing environment and late season fires not being able to be contained raise concerns of threat to freshwater turtles, magpie geese and the habitats of a little known bird called the yellow chat amongst of course um, extending uh, huge impacts on the environment. All of which have kinship connections to three language groups in the area. There was a call for a need a change in parks fire application management and indigenous knowledge formations guided a kin kinship to use climate to to address climate change and the increasing weed incursion on a floodplain would need to see direct change in application management to preserve the ecology of a floodplain with consultation and a working relationship with parks australia the fire regime in Kakadu was changed to incorporate higher levels of Indigenous knowledge and in turn provide ecological sustainability. Some of the fire applications needed to be micromanaged with flexible timeframes to implement strategic fire application at crucial times. Shifting weather patterns with longer dry seasons and sporadically wet seasons with unpredictable monsoons needed a dynamic fire regime in place and something that Indigenous knowledge from the traditional owners can and did implement. By understanding the environment via a kinship system based relational knowledge system, fire application was implemented by Indigenous knowledge from traditional owners to reduce the impacts of climate change. So thank you very much for um, um, for the invite to come here today and talk. And I'm looking uh, very forward to the uh, Q&A and ongoing dialogues. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, so, Karen and Scott, uh, would you turn your cameras back on, please? So, Rob, are you the lone Indigenous ranger at Kakadu, or are there more? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, no, not, not the only one. Um, we're fortunate um, in our tribal lands, obviously, to be part of um, Kakadu National Park, where there's a very, a very uh, strong joint management program running. So the Indigenous Ranger program is quite extensive. Um, and yeah, we have a lot, lot of people on the ground. So, you know, one thing that Jasper brought up um, and that is already well in hand in, in your world of Kakadu um, is the idea of co management. Um, that's just a term that we've been using here in the US that sounds awfully a lot like what you're already doing at Kakadu. Um, and uh, I'm wondering. Uh, Pastor, if you would um, have any thoughts about sort of how we get started in that direction. I know you mentioned um, David Troyer's book and his article in Atlantic Magazine, um, uh, something which I've read. Um, uh, but one thing that I've found in my 50 years of doing park work here in the U.S. is that um, all successes lead to larger success. Um, they become models and examples that you can use. And I've been looking for some uh, models that we can start with um, here. And maybe Rob, if you would say a word about how long your kind of engagement has been going on. I know you were a ranger for 15 years, but has it been as thoroughly integrated with Australian National Parks as it is today, or did it evolve to the present situation? Yeah, it's something that, is, that had evolved, of course. Um, and I think a um, very, very important point you mentioned was um, from small things, big things grow. And it's those relationships that, that are formed through um, organisations and corporations and then particularly grassroots level people. So I think National Parks obviously was um, something and I think this is um, relative to um, the United States also. It was, it was something that was actually used, used or maybe not intentionally, but it was definitely something, a device that um, dispossessed us from, from our country. But that's something that's changed through legislation and recognition. And with that then comes, of course, then building those relationships. Um, I'm an advocate for Indigenous knowledge and environmental science working together, even though they do come from totally different, um, you know, bases, but it can be done. And the limiting factor is is always the human condition, I think. So um, it's about those relationships and it's about um, pushing it through legislation and environmental policy. I think making that official, but it does come down to those working relationships with individuals and, and communities. So um, I'm going to assume you asked if I had any thoughts about about the same question. It's, it's your voice is very muffled and, and hard to uh, to understand, but I have a lot of thoughts, so I'm just going to go for it. Um, you know, and first of all, I, I want to uh, thank my, my co-panelists, Rob and Karen, for your very um, helpful and, and thought-provoking presentations. And, you know, we all know that climate change is uh, an existential threat to not just people, but to our non-human relatives. And that's something that Indigenous people are experiencing on a, on a closer level than, um, than a lot of other communities are. And so, you know, when it comes to the co-management piece of things, and, and I agree with you, Destry, that's big, big victories start with, with small successes. There's other things that we need to consider. I'm always looking at the big picture. I'm, I'm trained as a cultural anthropologist, and we take that holistic lens on the world where you look at every little thing, every little piece that might be a part. Thank you. 
lately about the boarding school experience for Indigenous communities in Canada and the United States, that there's a lot more that we have to deal with as part of this overall approach to heritage resource management and cultural resource management. There are tribes who I think would be delighted uh, in the abstract to be able to do these co-management types of projects, and many have been successful at trying to do it already. But before we even get to that point, there's this deeper level of acknowledgement that we need to have about what led us to this place in the, in, in the first place. So what is the history? And making sure that tribes and, and other indigenous communities have their survival needs met uh, first, because I can tell you, speaking for the, the TIPOs who are our NAFPO members and even those that aren't, we don't have the resources to do our jobs. And if we can't do that first, then it's, it's wonderful to talk about co-management, but it's an entirely different thing to actually make it happen. And so even though there are many success stories, I think there are a lot more instances where a lot more work needs to be done. Um, I'm thrilled that there are good examples. You know, Rob's examples are wonderful. And, you know, and Karen's discussion of the legal background of it is, is key. We need to integrate all of those pieces into our approach to bringing tribes to the table to do their own heritage resource management. Karen, do you have thoughts about this? Well, I think that there are many ways to go about these discussions with tribes. And I think the first point really is to begin those discussions and doing it well in advance of any research project or management plan development and to really begin to build a relationship of trust and begin exchanging information with indigenous communities and with Indian tribes about uh, what is proposed in terms of management, what role they might be able to play in that or what they can contribute to that. And I think also to Shasta's point, you know, asking the question of what resources would they need or what assistance would they need to have that effective engagement. And sometimes that might require um, a contract with the tribe or with the indigenous community in order to carry out a specific task. Or, uh, and I think there are different tools that can be used. Um, tribal people can be hired by the federal government, you know, as trainees and internship programs. I mean, there are a lot of different tools, I think, that are underutilized in creative ways. I think, as you said, Destry, if you wanted to start out maybe with some small steps, some of that is short, sort of showing a commitment to um, bring that other voice in and looking at the ways that, um, what are the different ways you can make that happen. Um, just, just a couple of years ago, um, US Congress authorized something called the Indian Youth Service. And the Department of Interior just put out guidelines for implementation of that Indian Youth Service Corps um, so that with some training and some uh, funding that the federal agencies from BIA to National Park Service to Forest Service to Bureau of Management can put into engaging tribal youth right. projects and work that leads to careers. Right. To, employment um, and that in the meantime is helping uh, to improve or protect or manage uh, cultural sites on and off reservation land. Right. Uh, where that kind of work has not been uh, prevalent. So that, that's a one small step in the right direction as more and more tribes develop their capacity for engaging their young uh, members, uh, tribal members in this kind of activity. That could be a good, one good place. Rob, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. I think um, definitely engaging uh, those communities and getting the younger generation to those um, conservation management is paramount to, to, to that happening getting people to the table to start talking about that co-management and joint management is is a is a big 
and complex things to start with all the policies and jurisdictions and um, legislation you have to cover. But once everyone's at that table, then the real work starts and that's about maintaining that relationship. And, and we look at it sometimes, we talk about our joint management with, with the federal government and Parks Australia's being, being like a marriage. You know, sometimes you have your ups and downs and, and, and things don't work out, but you have to come to a common understanding and, and, if, and if it's based in respect, then you can get yourself through the, through the highs and the lows and hopefully maintain a happy medium for a happy existence. But, but based in respect and, and constantly maintaining the relationship is, is, is key to making those things work. Getting to the table is the first big step, then the ongoing maintenance. We've been doing it for 20, 30 years now, and it, and it does have its challenges and, and pitfalls uh, constantly appear. But the good thing about when you do it together if one falls down or both falls down, you, you pick each other up and that and that bonds that relationship. And it's about that relationship. And that's something that Aboriginal people understand. Australia. It's about those relationships. So my advice to outside organisations to um, um, work with um, local uh, traditional owners is relationship-based in respect. Perfect. Thank you. One question. Uh, from the audience, um, how can um, non-traditional or non-indigenous um, park managers or public land managers um, be more respectful uh, as they engage uh, tribal people, indigenous people, in uh, assisting with management so that there's no longer a feeling as there often has been in the past of um, Taking, not very much giving. Um, uh, any thoughts on that, Jasper? Oh yes, many thoughts. <laughs> so, um, so first of all, because I'm not indigenous myself, I have gone through the process of learning how not to be a jerk when it comes to you know working with uh, with tribal folks and indigenous people. And I was extremely fortunate that when I got to Paula, um, you know, as as a young student to do my research i i had a friend who probably took one look at me and said she's going to get killed and i'm going to i'm going to uh, assert myself as her as her protector uh, so i was extremely fortunate to have somebody who was able to mentor me through the process um, and she was indigenous herself and so she taught me to shut up and listen and that's a hard thing for me to do i am a talker and sometimes she would just look at me from across the room and give me that little imperceptible shake of the head. And I would know, OK, no matter how much I want to ask a question, um, this is not the time to do it. Now, not everybody's going to be able to just show up somewhere and look pathetic like I did and have somebody decide to be their protector. But the lesson can still be translated. And that is listen. Doesn't mean that you're not going to ask some questions. But you may hear some things from people that, that make your eyebrows go up a little bit because it's a new idea. It's a new value that you might not have heard about um, and may not even necessarily share about what should be done in, in a park at a, at a heritage site. Um, but listening is the basis for respect. And the more you listen, you know, the more you're going to learn. And so when you're you know, if you're if you're wanting to make sure that you're not taking something, then whatever it is that you're considering doing, take it to those communities whose ancestral territories and traditional lands you're working on and say, what do you think of this? And don't be dissuaded by when you may not get a, a response right away. And in many cases, the tribal chairperson is also the person who's working in the in the utilities department and making sure that the lights stay on and that the water stays running um, and they're trying to answer requests for consultation so that's that's number two listen and number two be patient don't think a lack of response means a lack of interest wait and keep trying um and don't do anything without getting that that buy-in you might think that it's better to say well we never heard anything so we're going to go ahead and put up this interpretive sign or this display in our museum or in our cultural or our interpretive center um if you don't have uh, if you don't hear from the tribe then assume that they would not want it to be there and so listen and and 
patience. Those are there are two big ones. And I see Rob nodding, so I think maybe that it might be the same for for you in Australia. Yeah, definitely. Silent, silence is a respectful no pending. <laughs> a lot of times, um, we won't, we 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 would like to avoid conflict. So if there's a decision that's quite complex. We can foresee uh, some sort of conflict. There will just remain silent, and that's a respectful no pending on a, on a, on maybe an ongoing solution later. But yeah, um, those um, everything you said is uh, so important. It's uh, it's about it's about building those relationships and based on respect and patience is the key. Sometimes it takes quite some time and yeah. And, and, and having that deep understanding that our communities are going through a whole lot of other things too. They've got a whole lot of pressures going on in the community and, and um, you know, political, economical, cultural things going on. So um, be patient and build relationships. It's about building real ongoing relationships. Yeah. We have another question um, about uh, the ELC opportunity to scale indigenous knowledge up to uh, larger landscapes beyond uh, heritage sites. But I think, Rob, you already are at a full landscape scale. Um, I know several years ago, the Park Service here in the U.S. sent the superintendent at Canyon de Chez to Uluru, uh, another indigenous national park in Australia, to learn about the engagement of your Aboriginal people uh, on the park operations there. Um, and, and my thought has been, we're not just talking about co-management of small heritage sites, but uh, we are talking about large landscapes. So what, what are your thoughts on um, engaging across entire landscapes? And I don't think it has to just be uh, national parks. I mean, the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, here in the States obviously manage large landscapes. I have a lot to say about that, but I feel like I've already said a lot, so I want to give the other panelists an opportunity. Well, Karen, um, I know you were involved um, both in the past and more recently, I think, with um, the National Bison Range in, both in Montana and the Service Kootenai and they've entered into a management agreement with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to manage the National Bison Range uh, um, as one example of a large landscape here. Um, any thoughts? Um, I definitely think, especially as federal agencies are developing landscape strategies to deal with climate change, that there will be a need to consult with Indian tribes and multiple tribes um, about their efforts. And there'll be opportunities, I think, to engage and figure out how to work together on those issues. And I think in some regions and with some communities, there already is some of that active engagement that is happening, maybe that can be used as models. But I, I do think that, um, again, it will be important to figure out, you know, are there resources available to assist or facilitate in those type of engagements? And I think especially as agencies are putting their budgets together and that there is funding available to conduct some of these studies that they will need to recognize the need to consult with tribes to obtain both traditional ecological knowledge, but also knowledge about co-management or management of these resources. And some tribes do have a whole body of knowledge that really can be relevant and helpful to this effort. And I guess there will need to be ways to figure out how to facilitate those partnerships and also whether there's funding to go along with some of that. So I wanna go ahead and give my two cents uh, here or, or $2. <laughs> um, the, so wildfire prevention is something that's happening a lot in California right now. We're bringing back traditional burning. And when I say we, I mean uh, many different uh, tribal nations throughout the state. And the, the Karuk tribe in Northern California has done a lot on that. But uh, the, the thing I want to bring up that's important is the idea of just indigenous knowledge in heritage sites in general. 
And I, I was fortunate to be on a call with the UN, uh, UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples recently. And one of the things he brought up was that some of the management decisions that are made for environmentally sensitive areas involve keeping people out. And that's a huge mistake. It's not a mistake if you're keeping out, you know, like, you know, random, you know, people who are, are not knowing. I'll just say it. Rude Americans. You know, it's OK. There's rude Americans. <laughs> you can keep those people out. But when it comes to the indigenous peoples whose whose lands they're worried about and they're saying, well, this is a preservation. This is a it's it's a preserve for wildlife for the environment so we're not going to let people in at all indigenous peoples are the first land managers and in many cases they still have that knowledge and they should be allowed to use it so don't make the mistake of thinking that in order to preserve something it means that you can't let people in let the people in who have those traditional practices whether it's things like burning which we know from experience hard experience in california that one of the reasons we're being so impacted by climate driven wildfire is because for almost a century we haven't allowed anything to burn. Now the tribes used to do the burning. They did the burning because they wanted to encourage the growth of particular plant species and they wanted to create habitat for particular animal species. And once that stopped, we were essentially turning California into a giant tinderbox. And so bringing back the traditional knowledges in terms of wildfire is important, but it's not just wildfire. So I think working as much as possible with people who are still holding that knowledge for traditional land practices is key to managing these sites. Yeah, just quickly, um, in setting up those, those joint management projects, I think it's, oh, I know it's very important <clears throat> to start on an on a, on a <clears throat> equal basis, start right from the word go. So if, if you're an agency and you want to engage with your uh, original owners, don't roll out a plan <clears throat> with your executive board members and then go to the traditional owners and say, here, we've got a plan, let's do it. Wind back when you're first starting about it, <clears throat> first start thinking about it and start thinking about it, the structure of it with the traditional owners and <clears throat> start that relationship right from the word go. Because if it comes in later, it can be a little bit tokenistic. So get it off the ground together and then work together and focus on joint, on joint power and responsibility and control. Um, one of the things we've, we've developed in uh, joint, joint managed parks is um, a, board, uh, the board, a board of traditional owners with representatives from, the, from clan members from throughout the language groups in the national park. Um, so, so not just um, incorporating, but part of the system and structure and power and responsibility and control shared. That's, that's true joint management and that's true shared responsibilities and, and, and a true relationship. Thank you for that, Robert. And it, I just have to quickly say, just quickly say, when you were talking about the fire issues in California, we're having the same same issues here in uh, particularly the southern parts of Australia. And it's a tough one. Um, I know I've been working with traditional owners in southern parts of Australia to get those Indigenous knowledge practices back on country. And um, even if the government agencies and departments want to want it to happen, it's the legislation and all the policies that are attached to it that, that, that can be the blockers sometimes. So getting through that can be quite complex too. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, we have to conclude this to get on to our last panel of the day. Um, but we thank you for your time and wonderful thoughts. Um, the application of your Indigenous or non-Indigenous knowledge um, it is really remarkably helpful as we move forward with these tough issues. So thank you. Um, we will see everybody shortly for the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.